From South Carolina Public Radio, this is the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on November 13th, 2023, from South Carolina Public Radio Studios here in Columbia. This is our sixth SC 2024 episode, and for this episode, folks, we're looking at polling. Yes, love it, hate it, we all devour it. We want to know more about it, and we will in just a moment. But first, like pollsters, we love hearing from you. Uh, We here at The Lead have a voicemail box set up at 803-563-7169. We're not soliciting you. Come to us. Give us your hot takes. Tell us what's going on in your world. We want to hear from you guys. We love hearing from you. Uh, We are right around the corner from Thanksgiving. Gobble, gobble. Call us about your favorite monarch. If you would have been for the Revolutionary War. (laughs) You know, there were a lot of folks, different sides of that debate. 803-563-7169. All right, folks, before we kick off this episode, I just want to mention that we did see another candidate leave the race. The narrowing. That's right. The narrowing claimed another victim. Senator Tim Scott abruptly dropped out of the race this past weekend. We'll have a closer look in Saturday's podcast. But polls played a role in all of this. Isn't that right, Mayan? That's right, Gavin. And like you said earlier, love them, hate them. We all cannot get enough of polls. And so for this episode, we talked to one of South Carolina's most well-known pollsters and political consultants about why polling is so sacred, why it matters, how you can spot a good or a bad poll, and why reporters, candidates, and maybe literally quite everyone else shouldn't get too bogged down into it. Let's start with the obvious question. What do polls actually tell us? Gavin, you and I hear this so, so much during the campaign season. Polls are a snapshot, not a long shot, that can help guide a campaign's messaging where a candidate, let's say a Republican presidential candidate, should spend their time or what issues they should or should not be talking about. Should a candidate wade into the abortion debate? A poll could tell you that. Where do South Carolina voters stand on medical marijuana? There is a poll for that. Is a candidate wasting too much time in Iowa? Well, guess what? A poll can tell you that. And 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 lastly, Gavin, is this candidate going to make a dent in South Carolina's February 24th GOP primary? Let me guess. A poll can tell you that, too. Is there anything polls can't do, Mayan? Oh, there's a lot. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> but to elaborate on what polls can tell us, here's Trey Walker, Governor Henry McMaster's chief of staff and a longtime Republican consultant. You place a lot of emphasis on whether the polling demonstrates that, one, you're effectively communicating your message, and two, whether there is sufficient intensity with that message to actually move votes. You know, people like ice cream, but people aren't going to go vote because they like ice cream. They either got to be fired up about something or mad about something. And that intensity is something that a poll can measure. And so you understand just how important an issue is. And when you ask in a poll, would that affect your vote, that those type of, of binary type of questions, once you get into it, you learn, you know, will that, are they intense about it? And is that going to change their vote and make them likely to turn out or stay at home? Okay, I'm, I'm starting to get it. Now, what we also hear a lot of on the campaign trail, specifically from campaigns and their candidates, is that polling doesn't matter. Trying to be too cool, it doesn't matter. And they say no one's listening to the polling. But the reality is that candidates do care a lot about polling. They do care about whether their message is being received well by the public. And remember, campaigns ain't cheap. And polling can tell campaigns and candidates where they should be spending their resources. You hear about a candidate going all in on Iowa, for instance. Well, there was a poll that likely helped guide that decision. You hear about a candidate dropping out of the race well ahead of the primary? Yeah, I think the writing was on the wall. It's called a poll. (laughs) Polls do matter, but do all polls matter? Hmm. Now, polling is both good and bad. If the questions are asked right, if the data is scientific in nature, a campaign can use that to guide their resource spending uh, and where they they allocate their money. You know, are they strong in a particular area? Maybe they can run the score up. Does their message resonate particularly with a group 
of folks as it relates to geographics. Uh, so, you know, if they are strong evangelical, their message probably resonates more in Greenville than it does in, in Ori. Um, so that's where polling can come into effect. But of course, you can make a poll say anything you want to, depending on how you ask the question. You have to ensure that, that the questions you're asking is fair and understood, that your sample size is relevant, that you're targeting the right people who will come out and vote. Uh, all those things can, can make a poll more or less accurate. And I think it's important to know, too, that a poll is only a snapshot in time. Um, it, is, it is what is happening right now on the people that you're talking to. Uh, a lot of times campaigns uh, or the general public gets in trouble because they extrapolate that data too far out in advance. Um, that, is, that is not the right thing to do with polling, in my opinion. Uh, I, I think polling should be used to guide a campaign on how and where and what to say during the campaign, and particularly the resources that you spend for voter contact efforts. That was R.J. May, a Lexington state lawmaker who runs his own political shop. My aunt, it sounds like polls can tell us really anything and really nothing at the same time. Am I getting this right? Am I learning? Yeah, that's that's why we have a love-hate relationship with polling and why a lot of news outlets like the AP don't write standalone stories about polls. Their shelf life can be relatively short, but big, big butt here. Polls are particularly useful guides for everyone, especially if you're living and working in a first-in-the-South presidential primary state. And we're trying to figure out who is going to come in first and who, unfortunately, is trailing. To understand polling, Gavin, I think we should take our listeners back to school for a second. I know your favorite. And hear from Scott Huffman, a political scientist and the poll director for Winthrop University. We asked Scott, when you're getting ready to launch a poll into the field, what kind of people are you looking to talk to? Who is the best kind of, quote, voter? How should you push a poll out? Landline? Internet? text to your cell phone? Well, you know, the, the first thing you do is you have to think, OK, if it's this far out from an election, I pretty much want registered voters because the people who are going to vote haven't absolutely decided to vote or not. And that's different from likely voters. Likely voters are registered voters who are also nearly absolutely determined that they are going to show up. The closer you get to the election, you have to screen your registered voters for likely voters. Now, as far as getting them on the phone, that's one of the biggest changes in polling methodology is now pretty much no polls do only phone polling. There's a combination of online because people use their phones to take the polls, uh, calling cell phones and calling landlines. Now, only about 5% of South Carolinians are reachable only by landline and about 60% are, you know, cell only. So when you're calling, you have to call both cell phones and landlines. Now, remember, robo-polls are not allowed to call cell phones at all, the uh, interactive voice response where it says, if you want to vote for Bob, press 1. So you have to use live callers to call cell phones. So it's always a mix of using live callers, calling cell phones, calling some landlines, and doing it online. Response rates are now between 9 and 11 percent. So only 9 to 11 percent of people will take the call. Here's the big question, though. Are the people who will take a phone survey fundamentally different from those who will not take a phone survey? If the answer to that is yes, we have a problem. Fortunately, Pew, the Pew Trust, do a lot of research on this. And it's called non-response bias. Is there serious non-response bias? And they have actually determined, fortunately for the polling industry, there is not major non-response bias. People who answer polls are slightly more likely to do things like put a campaign yard sign in their yard. But in general, they're no more likely to be Democrat, no more likely to be Republican, no more likely to be male, no more likely to be female, no more likely to be white, no more likely to be non-white. So we are fortunate in that, although few people pick up the phone, the people who do and the people who don't are not fundamentally different. And that's the key. Mayan, we look at polls all the time. I feel like I see a poll per day, maybe per week. And I'm sorry, we're just going to keep seeing polls drop like the Philadelphia Eagles offensive line. <laughs> right, AT? AT can't respond. Go birds. Now, if you just love polls, there are a handful of websites. For example, 538 and Real Clear Politics where you can find all your polls at once, everything you want right there. From President Joe Biden's approval rating, the popularity of Congress, what a matchup between Biden and former President Donald Trump could look like, the list goes on. But if you're an infrequent poll watcher, it can be a little tough knowing exactly what you're looking at. 
and what you're looking for. Number one, it's important to see who is putting this poll out. Is it a campaign? Is it a reputable polling organization? Is it Mayan Schechter? Where is Ms. Schechter been? All of that can make a huge difference. So what should you look for out of the gate? Here's Scott again. So you always need to check the methodology, make sure it's a mixed methodology. At this point, there's, there's no other way to do it. Um, there are a lot of entities out there that do poll aggregations, and they generally look at the polling to find out whether or not it's a legitimate organization. And our, there's a, a group called the American Association for Public Opinion Research, and they have created what's known as a transparency initiative. And the transparency initiative, in order to sign on to it, you have to agree to make your methodology completely and utterly public, completely and utterly transparent, and make sure that you describe certain elements of your methodology somewhere on your website. Uh, you know, polls coming from the campaigns, you know they've done 20 polls and only released one. So it's sort of, you know, you have to make sure you're taking it as part of a broader context and not a single determinative factor. And it's important to keep in mind the difference between an early voting state poll out of Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina, for example, and a national early poll. Early state polls are much more informative, while national polls really show you who has the momentum nationally right now. That's according to Scott Huffman. For instance, we've seen Iowa polls that show former Governor Nikki Haley and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis tied. That's more informative than a national poll that shows DeSantis well ahead of Haley. So, Gavin, to really hone in on this lesson that we both underwent. When you're looking at a poll, you need to see who is doing it. You need to look at its methodology. How did they conduct the poll and when? And take a look at those crosstabs, which often aren't included in those big, shiny headlines we see. Oh, and my favorite part or my least favorite part is looking at the margin of error. And here's Scott Huffman explaining that. A poll is an estimate of the population. You can't interview the entire population. So you sample part of it and you're making an estimate. Well, how accurate that estimate is, is your margin of error. So if I say 48% of the, the, this sample, 48% of my poll support candidate uh, Smith, and there's a 4% margin of error, then I'm actually saying, in reality, somewhere between 44 and 52% support this candidate. So you have to add and subtract the margin of error to see how much there is. And one of the things people don't realize is if two candidates are only one percentage point apart, um, the margin of error of three, four percent means that they are in a statistical tie. You cannot say one candidate is ahead. So uh, anytime you have a candidate beyond the margin of error, that is a serious lead. Candidates that are tracking my multiple polls show one candidate ahead, kind of close to the margin of error, just within it, then that trend is probably right. But any single poll, if candidates are within the margin of error, be careful about extrapolating who's going to win from that. Okay, that was probably a lot to digest on polling. But we are not quite done yet because we need to talk about the elephant in the room, trust issues. My on what? I don't think that this is the time to have that conversation. That could be for another podcast. No, Gavin. I mean trust issues with polling. Uh, <laughs> Gosh. We learned a lot about polling from Scott, but in 2023, how much can we trust polls? Taking those tips and tricks we learned from so many people will go a long way in trusting polls, but not everyone is sold. You remember 2016, Gavin, mm. when headlines about Hillary Clinton beating Donald Trump were all over the news? Well, guess what? That didn't happen. That didn't happen. We were not able to get South Carolinian Robert Cahaley of the Trafalgar Group on this episode. We do hope to get him on more episodes, but here he is speaking with CNN about 2016. What we saw in 2016 is it was kind of a shy uh, Republican vote. People were kind of hesitant to admit it, and we had to use some vehicles to kind of get around that initial shyness uh, to where they could project and, and give a more hypothetical answer instead of a direct answer. But by 2020, it was that Republicans just didn't want to participate in polls, and, and you had to work extra hard. And the Republicans who did want to participate in 2020 tended to be the smaller group, the never Trump Republicans, who were excited to participate. So if you weren't careful, you could overestimate their proportionality to the Republicans in general. 
And then, Gavin, remember there was that expected so-called red wave of the 2022 midterms? We begin this Sunday morning with expectations of a red wave this Tuesday. It looks like n not just a Republican wave, but it, it, it could be a very big wave. Those were a couple of clips from Fox News. In 2022, Republican pollsters projected a red wave for the Republican Party in the midterms. Instead, it was a red misting, trickling, perhaps. Republicans not only did not take over the U.S. Senate, but they narrowly won the House, giving Democrats actually more leverage over legislation and recently that speaker's race that we're just not going to talk about, mm. not going to talk about. Mm -hmm. But so how did this happen? Because there was polling skepticism in both of those cycles. Here's Scott Huffman once more. 2016, national polling was spot on. State polling was off by just enough to get make the predictions wrong. Uh, 2022, there was a flood of incorrect polls that made the overall predictions wrong. Maybe I have trust issues now. And we'll save that for another podcast. <laughs> For now, listeners, always have a healthy bit of skepticism of polls. Do your research, look at who does them, their methodology, and don't let polls become your life unless you quite literally get paid to do poll work. <laughs> anyway, I've actually decided to poll our audience, Gavin. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I'm putting a poll into the field over the next 24 hours asking by just text whether the lead podcast should be turned over to me. It'll be just two questions. Should Mayon take over the podcast? And the answer options will be one, yes. To yes ish. Uh, that doesn't seem like a legitimate poll. A lot of problems there. And just by text, don't you think we're going to leave out a portion of our listeners? And isn't that just shoddy poll work? This is why they call it an internal poll, Gavin. And then I will disseminate it to the public and you will all write about it. Just don't look at the cross tabs. I keep losing this podcast every episode. <laughs> uh, OK, since it'll take me some time to send out this poll to each of my family members, my friends and their spouses, let's just go ahead and wrap this episode up, Gavin. Enough said. Thank you, Mayan Schechter. We appreciate that podcast episode on polling. And I'm going to do my own poll. Because send it to my dad. Join Mayan and myself in future episodes where we learn what it takes to win in South Carolina. And we'll look in detail at the past three primary winning campaigns. And then we're going to give you everything you need to know about the 2024 candidates, those that are still left, and how to vote in the February 24th primary. Subscribe to the South Carolina Lead wherever you find podcasts, and we'll have a new SC 2024 designated episode every other Tuesday. You can find out more about the primary, the latest news from the trail, and more at SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org and SCETV.org SC 2024, your home for campaign 2024 coverage. As always, thanks for listening to the pod, and make sure you show us your appreciation by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or a voicemail at 803-563-563. 7169. You can also text that number as well. No polls. For the South Carolina lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina. Oh, that's you enough know, time. That's look enough at Taylor time. and Travis. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> look at Taylor and Travis. If they can fall in love this fast. AT.